Building Disaster Resilience in Your Own Backyard, part of the Green Building Series. Topics today include the role of local government, hazards and risks in the District of Lanceville, building disaster resilience, sheltering in place, getting back to basics, and neighborhood emergency preparedness. What is the District of Lanceville responsible for? As you can see from this chart, emergency management is an ongoing cycle. For preparedness, the district has an active outreach program. Neighborhood and general emergency presentations are available upon request. The district participates in the Great BC Shakeout Earthquake Drill, Emergency Preparedness Week and more. Staff take emergency management training to be operationally ready to respond at all times. The district has emergency social services volunteers who provide 72 hours of emergency relief. The district also works with the Canadian Red Cross who assist with post 72 hour relief. The district is a member of the Regional Community Recovery Working Group, which is focused on the transition from local government recovery to longer term community recovery. Disaster financial assistance is available in some circumstances following an emergency or disaster. Check out Emergency Management BC's website for more details. Mitigation. The district encourages following fire smart principles, for example, vegetation management, using fire resistant building materials to help reduce the risk. Emergency management objectives. As mandated by the Emergency Program Act, these are local government's top priorities in order. These are immediate goals during the response and initial recovery phases. They also guide strategic, longer term goals that can be achieved by building self-sufficiency. What are your local hazards? What do you think are the biggest risks? Have you experienced an earthquake, a tsunami, a hazardous materials accident? This is a hazard vulnerability risk analysis and it's available on the district's website. It breaks down the hazards, their associated risks, frequency, and social, economic, and political impacts. It details identified hazards and response capacity. Wildland Urban Interface Fire. It's the biggest risk in the region. The top left picture shows Fire Chief Tom Whip standing in the Lanceville foothills, where there's much higher risk, less so than in Lower Lanceville. Fire Smart reduces risk of developing in high hazard areas. Check out the Community Wildfire Protection Plan on the district's website. Knowing about this hazard in advance, we can choose where and how we build to mitigate our risk. Pandemic and Epidemic we have the Culex pipian species of mosquito here that are competent carriers of the West Nile virus. No confirmed cases thus far in the island. A few equine deaths, so check the BC Center for Disease Control website for more information. Human death incidences have been moving north from Oregon and Washington and west from Alberta, but equine deaths are more common from West Nile virus. Do you remember the 2009 H1N1 rush on vaccinations? The real problem is not the amount of people dying from flu. A small percentage of people die from flu every year. It's the impact on healthcare, first responders, parents, schools, daycares, workplaces, essential services. Hospitals especially had to rethink their surge capacity and available resources. Earthquakes. The Cascadia subduction zone is located approximately 100 kilometers west of Vancouver Island. The last 9.0 magnitude earthquake was in January 1700, 303 years ago. The date was pinpointed using tree rings and First Nations oral history. The quake caused ground along the coast to drop five feet, lowering coastal forests into salt water. Historical records in Japan describe waves 30 feet high hitting the coast on the 27th to the 28th of January, 1700. Along with earthquakes comes a potential risk of tsunami. However, you can see from the map that along the Strait of Georgia, our risk is far lower than on the West Coast. Our main issues will be infrastructure damage. Distribution systems and transportation corridors may be damaged and limit first responders. That's why it's critical to be able to survive on your own for at least one week to one month. Knowing our earthquake hazard in advance, we can choose now to prepare ourselves. Climate change and disaster resilience. We have to plan now for known increasing risk in the future. How does this impact coastal communities? Climate change brings sea level rise, more extreme weather, and extended wildfire season. 
If a major disaster happened right now, how would your family fare? Are you well prepared and have a family emergency plan? How will you reunite if you're separated and can't get home due to an emergency or disaster? Do you have emergency supplies at home? How will you communicate? Do you have a grab and go bag? Disasters do happen. It's just a matter of when. And when they do, there's no next time, no second chance, and no time out. When disaster strikes, it can happen quickly and without warning. It can force you to leave your neighborhood or confine you to your home. Local government and relief workers will be on the scene after disaster, but we can't reach everyone right away. Some common myths about disasters and preparedness. I'm sure we've all heard at least a few of these. It'll never happen to me. It's all insured, so I'm okay. I'm sure we'd all cope. Can't plan for the unforeseen. If I don't have a disaster, I've wasted my money. The government will take care of me right away. Let's hope not. And now for the good news. Choose not to be disaster victim. Be proactive. Be empowered. Be prepared. What you do now will determine what life will be like after a large emergency or disaster. What is disaster resilience? It's the ability to adapt and change in ways that are proactive, that build local capacity and that ensure essential needs are met. All the comforts of home. What do we use our home for? For basic shelter, warmth, cooking, sleeping, hygiene. We tend to take these amenities for granted. In 2007, due to a major storm, the power was out in many areas from seven up to 11 days. How did you manage? Were you able to meet your basic needs on your own? Do you know anyone that was not able to cope? Why? Getting back to basics. Happiness belongs to the self-sufficient. Old wisdom that still rings true. Moving beyond tin food and the 72 hour myth. This will keep you full for a while, but what about when your three day supply runs out? Food security is an issue when you live on an island. Studies have been conducted that show we have three days of food on grocery store shelves before resupply. What if roads and bridges are damaged and you can't drive to the store? Shelves would likely be empty anyway. Backyard farming, moving towards sustainability on an acre or less. Not what you may typically think of as disaster planning, but having food available close at hand helps you to shelter in place effectively during an extended emergency. How big a backyard do you need to live off the land? On a quarter acre lot, depending on your layout, you could produce a lot of food. In addition to saving money, if you had to shelter in place, you'd be well positioned. On a one acre lot, you could divide your land into raising livestock and a garden for raising fruits, vegetables, and forage crops. Raising three pigs a year can feed a family of four twice per week for a year. One year of meat requires 207 square feet at a minimum. In addition to being self-sustaining during a disaster, you get to eat healthy food. The best staple crops for building food self-sufficiency should be easy to harvest and store, return good yields, and be calorie dense. Try to grow foods that don't require fossil fuels to store them. Continuous growing. 12 garden beds measuring 4 feet by 8 feet each can produce more than 2,000 pounds of vegetables per year when planned carefully. To ensure an abundance of vegetables, grow multiple crops in the same area at different times. Crops such as spinach, peas, broccoli, and beets can be planted and harvested in the spring, leaving the garden beds ready for planting of summer crops like tomatoes, zucchini, peppers, and corn. Once these are harvested, the cool season crops can again be planted and grown into the fall. Preserving the harvest. Did you grow up eating food that your family had preserved? Have you eaten smoked fish or canned meat? Did you dry your own fruit? Our mothers, grandmothers, and elders did this as a matter of course. We could learn a lot from them, and it's much tastier. Storing the harvest. You've planted, faithfully tended your garden, harvested, and now it's time to store your bounty. 
It can be very simple. Just know how to store different groups of vegetables. Storing food is as simple as you choose to make it. There's many types of root cellars. There's a garden row storage. For example, cover a row of carrots with hardware cloth. Add eight inches or more of mulch or make a hay bale fortress. That can extend the life of lettuce, escarole, tomatoes, broccoli, and chard. A plant protection tent. A plastic sheet over a row anchored with rocks. Mounds or clamps. Above ground mound of vegetables covered with earth and insulation. Trenches. A buried barrel, drain tile, or covered metal can. A root cellar box. Earth pits. Many books and articles are available online, many with very easy to follow directions and diagrams. You have your root cellar, now how to store your harvest. Date all your perishables. Flour and nuts go rancid. Keep them very cool and use them fast. Watch for mice and insect damage. Have a method of rotation and set up a reminder system to do it routinely. Do it when you change your smoke alarms. Save some seeds for sprouting to provide fresh nutrients along with preserved foods. The basic rules of food storage. Use it or lose it. Secondary energy and heating sources. Fireplaces can be inefficient. Check out the regional district of Nanaimo's wood stove exchange. There's other incentives as well. Check out the Regional District of Nanaimo website to learn more about the rebate programs or call the Sustainability Coordinator to learn more. The ability to shelter in place doesn't just apply to food and your immediate needs. You can design ways for your home to have more resilient systems. Think about your potable water needs, water for hygiene, livestock and pets, or storing water for emergencies. You need at least two liters per person per day. For a family of four, that's 240 liters for one month. How you store it and where. Check out the Regional District of Nanaimo's WaterSmart program. They have great information and presentations. Check out the RDN's website. Doing your part. Have a grab and go bag in your vehicle. Have a family emergency plan and practice it. Put together home emergency supplies and make sure you rotate them. Establish a meeting place, a reunification plan, and out-of-province contacts. Plan for pets, livestock, elders, and those with varying levels of abilities. You'll find lots of useful information on the Regional District of Nanaimo's website. And you can book a presentation about assembling an emergency kit or personal preparedness plans for your organization or group. Email bready at rdn.bc.ca today. Neighborhood Emergency Preparedness. Experience has shown that after disaster, it may take time for first responders to reach many individuals and neighborhoods. In areas that are isolated or have limited access, it may take even longer. Plan to be self-sufficient for a minimum of one week for up to one month. People who have experienced disasters have witnessed the way in which neighbors naturally come together to help one another. Being prepared means increased confidence. You have a plan, you're prepared, and are self-sufficient. Book your free workshop with Fiona McInnes at bready at rdn.bc.ca. Get involved. Go to rdn.bc.ca and click on Get Involved. Each tile shows different ways to build resilience through information, workshops, rebates, and more. Check it out and get involved. If you have any questions or would like more information, here's how to get a hold of us. Together, we can work towards building a resilient future. Be proactive, be safe, be ready.